Let me welcome all of you to the Peterson Institute this morning. I think we've already had a, a lesson reaffirmed, namely that it's probably a mistake to start events at 8.30, uh, since people tend to show up only at 9 o'clock. But uh, thanks to those of you who did come at the appointed hour, and we will get the program started. Um, with our usual prescience, um, we decided to hold this event on the transatlantic relationship in an era of growing multipolarity uh, here on the weekend of the IMF annual meetings. Uh, many of you know the Institute has always staked out this Friday of the IMF meetings weekend to have a major event, and we thought no topic could be better this year than addressing the transatlantic relationship. Uh, I say that was prescient because with debates about China's currency and currency wars and uh, risks to the recovery around the world, uh, those third party questions, to call them that, uh, certainly loom very large in the US-Europe relationship at this point in time and add flavor to uh, certainly the discussions this weekend, the policy discussions that are ongoing uh, and will be a, uh, uh, an underlining of our topic that the transatlantic relationship does now need to be seen uh, in a growingly multipolar world. Uh, that's, of course, not to say there are not some key issues on the transatlantic front just per se. Uh, there have been differences about the pace of recovery and the relative weights to attach to, on the one hand, continuing recovery stimuli, and on the other hand, beginning to consolidate. Uh, the U.S. and at least some in Europe have taken different views on that. Financial regulatory reform. Uh, there have been now widespread agreements through the BIS and the FSB, uh, but there have been and continue to some extent to be differences between U.S. and at least some European countries on how to implement those issues. And of course, there are very well-known disagreements over how to reform the IMF and its governance structure uh, that to some extent pit the US and Europe against each other. So uh, the transatlantic agenda is uh, not only rich in terms of uh, content, but critically important in terms of which way the world is going. And therefore, we hope this conference will be both relevant and helpful in uh, advancing discussion and perhaps moving uh, the debate in the direction of uh, constructive resolution. Uh, I want to thank very much at the outset our friends from the European Commission uh, who have sponsored and indeed inspired this uh, event. Um, we here at the Institute are very pleased and honored to work closely with the Commission uh, on a regular basis uh, over the last several years. Uh, they have supported and sponsored a number of our projects here. We work with them closely and I'm delighted to thank them very much uh, for doing this. Uh, I'm also extremely pleased to thank our other co-hosts, Bruegel and Joan pisani Ferry, who, from whom you will be hearing shortly. Uh, Bruegel is, of course, uh, the relatively new still, only five years old, uh, think tank in Brussels that for the first time tries to create a pan-European think tank devoted to Europe's global role and the international economic issues that Europe confronts and therefore has been a natural partner and a close working colleague of us here at the Peterson Institute uh, literally almost from the day of its inception under Jean's leadership. So we're delighted to work closely with uh, Bruegel uh, with the support of the Commission and to uh, bring together this uh, eminent group of European and American and third country experts to talk about the range of issues that are on your uh, program. Uh, the order of the day will be, uh, we hope, expeditious. We have a very full program. Uh, we will try to move uh, uh, very much in keeping with our uh, timetable. Um, for the purposes of the speakers, I'll just mention that uh, most people have PowerPoint, so the panels will, uh, the members of the panels will each speak from here use their PowerPoint, and then the full panels will take the podium to answer questions and enter into discussion with the group. Okay, to get us started, uh, Marco Beauty uh, is Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs at the Commission, has been in that position for about two years. 
after having served for a number of years uh, in that directorate as an economic advisor to the president of the commission uh, and indeed an official at the commission now for over 20 years. Um, he's Italian by nationality. Uh, he has taught in Brussels, at Florence. He's written extensively on the Economic and Monetary Union, on macroeconomic policy, European unemployment issues, and he is uh, the, uh, the deputy for the EU on the G7, the G20, all the key groups that are now meeting to try to address the problems that we're talking about. So Marco is in the middle of this. He, we've had the pleasure of his gracing our our uh, platform before, and it's a particular pleasure, Marco, to introduce you again and ask you to lead off today's conference. Marco Beauty. Now, thank you very much, uh, Fred. Thanks uh, for uh, for the invitation. Thanks for the honor to uh, open uh, this. Um, the worst of today, I think very important uh, topic. I'm going to disappoint you uh, by uh, not uh, addressing directly the issue of the you know, currency war uh, and uh, what is uh, in store uh, on, that, uh, on that front. Uh, you may uh, derive indirectly from what I say uh, some conclusions on that uh, front uh, uh, as well, but I'm not going to enter into these uh, deep waters, though I am expecting that uh, the rest uh, of the day uh, we will have uh, the opportunity to do so and uh, we are going to listen with uh, utmost uh, uh, attention. Now what I would like to uh, ask today um, uh, in my opening address uh, is uh, whether Europe is having a good crisis. And I think one can ask whether the UK, and whether the UK, uh, yes, also, and, uh, but the US uh, and the global economy are having a good crisis. I mean, what is a good crisis, what is a bad crisis? I think a good crisis is, um, is a crisis in which the, um, res the policy response is not only, let's say, adequate or limits the damage in the short term, but lays the foundations for better response uh, in the future and give the, let's say, the possibility of, uh, uh, let's say, reducing the likelihood of similar crises uh, uh, in the future. So this is my simple-minded uh, uh, definition of what is a good crisis, and, uh, and you reverse the sign, uh, that's what a bad crisis. A bad crisis uh, is, um, um, is a crisis in which the policy response, uh, even if allegedly uh, effective in the very short term, actually creates further problems in the future, uh, which would uh, um, heighten actually the deep-rooted structural problems that uh, were there uh, in the first place. Now, my tentative claim uh, here, this does not belong to my, uh, to my presentation, but uh, it looks interesting enough. Uh, um, <laughs> to distract you in case uh, you think I'm uh, uh, getting uh, excessively boring. Um, so the, um, I think my tentative claim at this stage is that uh, Europe is, in spite of, of all the difficulties, having a pretty good crisis, or has a chance, let's say better, has a chance to have a pretty good crisis. Let me uh, try to articulate my uh, reasoning. Um, first of all, I think not without difficulties uh, and uh, possibly under the, uh, or certainly under the threat, now, okay, even, even better. Okay, uh, under the threat of, um, uh, of very severe economic consequences, uh, in certain cases under the uh, threat of, let's say, near-death uh, experience, uh, has uh, taken very unpopular yet decisive uh, decisions, let's say, at the EU and at the national level. This is my first point, and I'll, 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 I'll quickly uh, tell you uh, why. Second, uh, there is a substantive consensus, policy consensus, on the, po on the main priorities uh, going forward, um, nourished also by the um, uh, emerging global fora like uh, the, uh, uh, the G20. 
So in spite of the fact that the, at least uh, looking from the outside, uh, in, uh, in a number of cases, uh, uh, European countries uh, look on different pages. Uh, I think the, at the end of the day, fostered also by the crisis, the deep consensus is uh, stronger than what uh, usually perceived in, uh, in the media debate. And third and final, the institutional setup which will emerge uh, from the crisis in Europe will be considerably stronger than the, um, let's say, coordination framework that we had uh, in entering the crisis in the first place. Now, you can apply, uh, let's say, the same uh, questions to the US and to the global economy and then uh, uh, draw your own consequences whether the, the, the US and the global economy are having, a, uh, let's say, a good crisis um, uh, as well. Now, first point on the unpopular decisions. I know it has been debated here, it is still uh, debated uh, on this side of the Atlantic and not only uh, in Europe. Ultima ratio notwithstanding, Germany and other uh, you know, skeptical uh, member states have delivered on financial assistance to Greece and agreed upon the, Europe uh, the European Financial Stability Facility, the European Financial Stability Mechanism, and activated the balance of payment uh, uh, assistance uh, that uh, has been dormant for uh, non-Euro area countries, that has been dormant for uh, about 15 years. I think one should not belittle uh, these achievements here. The process was obviously uh, uh, bumpy, it was very difficult, but having had the possibility and, uh, 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 and the stamina to convince very skeptical public opinions in a number of member states, I think is an achievement that should not be uh, set aside uh, uh, lightly. And I would uh, um, warn against uh, against uh, putting all the emphasis uh, on the process rather than, uh, than the result. On the Greek side, on, on the implementation of the, um, uh, let's say, of the adjustment, on the Greek side, I mean, Greece uh, is, okay, it's a small country, it's a very fractured uh, society. Experience in the past uh, is that uh, uh, achieving a political consensus uh, to implement uh, difficult choices has proved uh, uh, is extremely difficult. In spite of this, I mean, the, uh, there is uh, um, conviction in the implementation of the program. Of course, uh, uh, big challenges are in front of us because here this is a program that uh, um, uh, is over, over several years. Uh, and, uh, you know, turning around the Greek economy is uh, not a question of a few quarters. So, but for the time being, uh, the implementation is a forceful, uh, forceful one. And aside from occasional uh, demonstrations and, uh, and some riots, uh, which are very, you know, a very mi uh, minority of the of the population. I mean, there is a, there is a, uh, acceptance that there is no other way around, and the uh, society has uh, has accepted that. Overcoming a lasting denial, Spain also uh, has embarked on a path of uh, structural reforms and consolidation. It has actually. Uh, at least so far decoupled, if you look at the spreads, from the other vulnerable countries. Uh, and I think if one has to pinpoint uh, a single element which has allowed this decoupling of uh, Spain um, compared to, the, to, uh, uh, to other vulnerable countries, I would uh, attribute that to the to the fact that Spain has embraced the stress test in July in a very forceful way, putting everything on the table and also setting the standards for the other European countries. So this uh, has uh, uh, helped uh, um, a lot. And, uh, and uh, Spain, for the moment, has gone, let's say, out at, uh, of, the, of, the lime, uh, of the limelight. One should not forget also that um, Eastern Europe with, again, all the vulnerabilities and all the fragilities that are still there, um, is in a considerably better position than he was uh, 12 or 18 months ago. Some, uh, probably even in this room here, uh, predicted at the time a total meltdown. Eastern Europe was about to disappear 
uh, and, uh, and being <coughs> swamped uh, in, uh, in uh, let's say, financial and economic despair. Uh, solutions, fantastic solutions of uh, reviewing uh, uh, all the currency arrangements, uh, exchange rate and monetary arrangements at the time were put on the table. Predictions uh, was uh, of, as I said, uh, of a total meltdown. It has not happened. It has not happened. Of course, the, f the counterfactual uh, is not there. One could say, yes, there is a uh, deep loss in output. Uh, uh, the increase in, uh, in uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, yes, uh, true. Do not having a counterfactual, I'm more comfortable with the choices that we pushed as the European Commission at the time to stabilize the region without calling into question the monetary uh, and exchange arrangements that uh, were there, rather than some other uh, scenarios which, in my view, would have led to disaster. So this is, uh, let's say, the first uh, set of issues, uh, uh, so not without difficulties and under the threat of severe economic consequences, some popular decisions have been implemented at the EU and national level. Second point is that there is a substantive consensus on the main policy priorities uh, going forward. Um, first, the EU member states are committed to a balanced exit strategy. Um, balanced and differentiated exit strategy, also on the fiscal side. Here I think it's important to stress that the um, characterization in uh, the press uh, often <coughs> that uh, uh, Europe is rushing to the exit uh, in an undifferentiated way led by uh, unreasonable uh, uh, push by uh, Germany is uh, uh, not correct. Uh, actually, if you, look at the, the, if you look at Germany in particular, and the fiscal stance in Germany, and uh, you strip out the rhetoric, uh, you will actually see that the uh, exit in uh, Germany from the fiscal stimulus is actually consistent with the available fiscal space that exists in Europe. Other countries, of course, the vulnerable ones have no choice, and they will have to conduct uh, painful procyclical uh, uh, policies. But uh, take uh, Germany in the first place, I mean, the fiscal policy continues to be expansionary this year. And next year, there is only a small adjustment, uh, you know, up to 0.5% of, uh, um, of GDP, considerably uh, smaller than in other countries, considerably smaller than what has been also recommended by the uh, IMF to 1 to 1.5 percentage point retrenchments. So my claim here is that uh, Aside from the rhetoric and the perception, which uh, maybe is, uh, plays well also domestically uh, uh, in Germany, actually the differentiated fiscal exit is there and it's been implemented. I think there is um, uh, agreement that uh, structural reforms uh, are there to redress uh, um, you know, poor growth and macroeconomic uh, uh, imbalances. I think this is, uh, is also... a um, uh, an, important, uh, an important point of consensus, and if one looks uh, at what could have been the uh, response uh, in terms of you know, protection, I mean, uh, in terms of reversing reforms of last year, I think it is comforting that uh, the structural reforms remain um, uh, uh, top of the agenda in a number of uh, member states. And I, I uh, also mentioned that the bank stress test and the fact uh, that uh, this also here with a lot of resistance. I mean, we are talking about 27 jurisdictions, and not one. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, standards for transparency set by the uh, July uh, stress test, and the fact that there is a substantive consensus to repeat it every year, and with a new uh, systemic risk board, and with a new European Banking Authority, I'm sure that uh, we are going to have uh, um, an exercise uh, next time round uh, that is, uh, uh, let's say, even mm, uh, more uh, convincing than the uh, one that we have just uh, uh, had. And finally, uh, I think the traditional divide uh, between France and Germany, I mean, leaving aside the body language of, its, uh, of their leaders, uh, I think is deeper post-crisis than before uh, the crisis. 
final point is, uh, is my third one, is that the institutional setup will be substantially stronger as we exit uh, the crisis in Europe. We are going to have a reformed uh, stability and growth pact. The Commission has put forward uh, uh, proposals uh, 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 about a week, ten days ago. We are going to have a new excessive imbalances procedure to tackle what was left uh, out uh, in uh, the first ten years of EMU, namely the focus on, uh, uh, on imbalances. I, I just mentioned there has been agreement on the European Systemic Risk Board to tackle the um, macro-financial uh, risks. The European uh, Financial Stability Mechanism um, agreed in, at the beginning of May together with the European Financial Stabilization um, uh, one facility and one the mechanism. So overall uh, the uh, 500 billion of uh, uh, guarantees. Um, all this uh, with the agreement which is perceived as being, uh, I mean, so far essentially procedural, but is, uh, I think, very important if implemented in earnest, is the agreement to have the so-called European semester versus a national semester. So what does it mean uh, in practice? It means that in the first part of the year, um, member states will come and discuss together with the European Commission, with the European institutions, on common orientations for their, uh, for their budget, for their uh, reform uh, agenda, which will then, in the second part of the year, will be implemented at the national uh, level. So there is this uh, uh, ex-ante uh, coordination, which, uh, has, uh, which I think he has, has uh, the chance to uh, in, uh, strengthen the uh, uh, governance. Final thing that is, uh, I think, not to be also belittled is that, and learning here from also from the uh, empirical evidence uh, on uh, large body of literature, um, we have proposed to have a directive on uh, minimum requirements for national budgetary frameworks at the national level, uh, which would be consistent with the engagement taken at the, the European uh, at the European level. So and this uh, uh, would have been unthinkable uh, before the crisis. It actually, uh, you know, calls into question. Uh, you say, well, the, the limitation of sovereignty uh, between the national and the, the European uh, level, which I think is very, is very, very important. Within this framework here, the Commission will have uh, uh, to take up more responsibilities, both as independent referee and as enforcer of the new rules. So the, the whole setting um, seems, to, it seems to me has the potential for uh, making the whole institution stronger, uh, let's say, after the crisis than before, um, than before the crisis. It is a chance, it's not necessarily a done uh, deal. Many of these things are there. The issue is, uh, for instance, on the various uh, stabilization mechanisms that, that have been put in place uh, as emergency tool to fight the crisis, whether um, these will be made permanent and how they will be made uh, permanent. I would stress more the how than the, the, than the if. Um, whether the, uh, on a number of proposals uh, that are on the table, uh, the member states or the council, the euro group will follow the, uh, uh, the commissions and then of course, uh, the proof of the pudding is the, in the eating, so in the implementation of all, uh, uh, of all this, uh, of course, remains to be seen. And the jury, for obvious reason, is uh, not even, I would say, is out, it's been assembled at, uh, at the moment. So this is the picture um, that I, would, uh, I wanted to uh, put in front of you. Don't accuse me of over-optimism or benign uh, or, uh, you know, leniency uh, in, uh, uh, in this. It may appear uh, so, but uh, I mean we are fully aware of the difficulties uh, uh, ahead. So my conclusion is, uh, um, Europe is has a chance to have uh, a good crisis, a chance uh, to be transformed in reality. Thank you. Marco, thank you very much for posing right at the outset a central question I'm sure we'll discuss all day. You argue and make a strong case Europe has had a good crisis, 
uh, we should ask, has the United States had a good crisis? Uh, has the world had a good crisis in the sense that you mentioned of using it to uh, move forward in terms of both economic uh, policy frameworks and institutional arrangements to uh, try to insulate against repetitions of what has gone on. So we will turn immediately to our first panel, which addresses the critical question that Marco was already uh, uh, looking at from a European uh, perspective, a joint exit strategy from the crisis. As we've tried to do throughout this conference, um, we will have a presentation at the outset from both a European and a US perspective. In some cases, it's a joint paper, as on this panel. In some cases, it's parallel papers. But in every case, we want to bring together, right at the outset of the discussion, a, um, a transatlantic perspective coming from uh, authors on both sides. In this case, we are delighted, very privileged, that uh, the first paper on the joint exit strategy uh, has been prepared uh, jointly. Uh, by our own Adam Posen and by Jean Pisani Ferry, whom I've already mentioned. Uh, Adam, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, is now a member of the Monetary Policy of the Bank uh, Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Um, he's in fact made a few waves in that context here in the last week or so, uh, proposing some significant uh, new uh, initiatives for monetary policy by both the Bank of England and around the world. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, an element that will be discussed today. Adam continues as a senior fellow here at the Institute. He was deputy director for three years before uh, he went off to London and uh, is continuing to be very active in our programs, both here and as our de facto subsidiary uh, in Europe. Um, Jean Pisani Ferry, as I mentioned before, has been director of Bruegel since its creation. He's the creating director um, for now uh, almost six years. Um, he had worked at the European Commission, he had directed CEPI, the main French think tank on international economics. Um, he'd been in the French government uh, as economic advisor to the Minister of Finance and uh, as executive president of the Council of Economic Analysis, where we sometimes got together uh, when he was in that role. So Adam and Joan will make the initial presentation. We then also have discussions from both sides. We're particularly privileged uh, on the European side to welcome, again, Lorenzo Bini Smoggy. Uh, Lorenzo, of course, is a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank after a long and distinguished career in the Italian uh, Ministry of the Economy and Finance. He's been a vice president of the Economic and Financial Committee of the EU itself, chairman of Working Party 3 in the OECD, one of the pillars, I think it's fair to say, of the international monetary discussion and certainly its transatlantic component uh, for the last decade or more. For the U.S. perspective, I'm particularly pleased to welcome back uh, one of our authors from a while back, uh, Nurio Rubini. Um, I won't remind you of his famous uh, uh, nickname that he has now. We'll see if he makes good uh, on that in his presentation. Uh, Nurio, of course, teaches at NYU's Stern School of Business. He's the co-founder and chairman of Rubini Global Economics, a very successful economic and geostrategic information service and consultancy. And he, of course, spent some time in the Treasury uh, back during the Clinton administration. Because this is a discussion of transatlantic issues in a global or multipolar context, we are also including on each of our programs uh, third country views or views from outside the transatlantic world. And in this case, again, we're very lucky. Uh, one of our discussants is Stan Fisher, uh, known, I think, to all of you. He's just uh, uh, received uh, his second term as governor of the Bank of Israel, having begun that responsibility back in 2005 after several years in the private sector at Citigroup. Prior to that, of course, Stan was first <coughs> deputy managing director at the IMF for seven years in which he played a central role Mexican crisis, Asian crisis, Russian crisis, Brazilian crisis, all those things that hit in the second half of the 1990s. Uh, even before that, Stan, of course, was famous, well-known as one of the leading uh, uh, economists, professor at MIT, um, having uh, produced a, a range of seminal studies on topics from inflation to exchange rates and one of the true pillars in our field. Our other third country discussant is Rajiv Kumar, Rajiv is now Director General of the Federation of Indian Chambers, Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FIKI, 
uh, with whom those of you who work with India do a lot. Uh, prior to that, he was director uh, and chief executive officer of the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, ICRIER, which is the Indian equivalent of Bruegel in Europe and this institute here, with whom we have worked a great deal. And so we look to Rajiv to bring us a view from the emerging markets on this question of exit strategies from the crisis. Joan, head out. Uh, thank you, Fred. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back uh, at the Institute for this, uh, this joint conference and, uh, and to present this paper, uh, Joint with Adam, uh, which I think should have a different title. I just thought uh, we should change this long and boring title to Who's Afraid of a Good Crisis, uh, which would be very much a follow-up to, to what Marco said. Uh, let me uh, just say about Adam that uh, he's in this uh, silent period, having just uh, uh, had a, a meeting of the, of the MPC of the Bank of England, it's, so it's, uh, uh, he, he wouldn't uh, have been able to, to, to say any word here, uh, so he, he, he decided uh, to stay in, in the UK. And I, but his ghost is, is here, provided you remember that the ghost uh, that's with, with us is the, the PIE cost, not the Bank of England cost. Um, the question uh, we uh, started from in this paper is what explained the fact that uh, we had such uh, a strong coordination during the crisis and that in the aftermath of the crisis, Europe and uh, the US uh, are starting to uh, take different directions as regards macroeconomic policy. Um, is it because of, uh, of economic developments? Is it because of policy uh, doctrines? Is it because of institutional constraints? Is it because of political economy? And what are the, the implications of that? Uh, but uh, certainly we've moved from this strong uh, London consensus to starting with the Toronto summit and uh, now with this, uh, these meetings and in the run up to Seoul, uh, a certainly a higher degree of, of differentiation. Now, uh, what uh, uh, we, we do in the paper is that we review uh, the various uh, explanations. We start with uh, an analysis uh, or description, at least, of economic developments on both sides of the Atlantic. And then we go on to monetary policy, fiscal policy, and address international consequences. Uh, we do it by looking at the US, the Euro area, and the UK. And I would like to insist on the UK because uh, it's not only because Adam is, is, is there, but also the UK is both interesting in its own right and interesting because it has some characteristics that are uh, very much shared with the, the US and, and some characteristics that's shared with the Euro area, depending on uh, uh, institutional aspects or uh, economic institutions and, and <coughs> functioning markets. So it's an interesting testing case for what determines differences. Starting with economic development, so what you have here is GDP, unemployment, productivity, and investment in all uh, three uh, areas, uh, starting with, uh, with, uh, with the beginning of the crisis and then, and then development since. What is most striking is that obviously we have this uh, uh, simultaneous development as regards GDP, uh, uh, and we've had uh, unemployment on the rise uh, uh, everywhere, but it's, what is most striking is the fact that the U.S. stands out with a productivity surge. Uh, and as a, as a obviously, a counterpart with a much deeper fall in employment than in Europe. By European standards, this is not an exceptional employment recession. When you talk to labor market people in Europe, they say, oh, we've seen that before. It's nothing new. I mean, it's not worse than, than uh, in, the, in the past uh, recessions. Whereas here, uh, clearly, the speed and the level of unemployment makes this recession as something that stands out. So that, they, they, let's say, on the political economy side. On the economic side, what is striking is this difference in productivity. And it's, it is a particularly striking because you could say, oh, that's all labor market institutions, that's uh, the, the employment protection, but that would be an explanation for Euro-area countries, for continental European countries. 
not a very good explanation for the UK, whose labor market and institutions are closer to the US labor market institutions. Um, and actually, the countries that stand out here is Spain, really, that is having a, a development that is fairly similar to that in the, in the US. So that's, that's a, a, major, a major difference uh, that, that we are seeing that has a, a significant implication for the analysis and the perception of the situation. Now, uh, if we look at uh, uh, now demand side and supply side uh, differences, on the demand side, uh, one um, uh, clear difference, and here I'm, I'm, I'm putting a, a table that is corrected with respect to one in the paper which had some uh, uh, errors, what clear difference is is that the extent of deleveraging going forward on the household side is clearly uh, much higher in the US and actually in the UK than in the euro area where on average there hasn't been such a, a rise in, in household uh, debt, some countries obviously being, being different. So uh, that uh, suggests there are reasons to be more worried about the outlook for, for demand in the US and uh, in Europe, or in the euro area at least. But what I would like to insist on is the supply side. Because what I think, uh, what we think, is particularly striking is the degree to which there are different perceptions on what's happening on the supply side. Basically, the US uh, policy community is optimistic about the damages, the lasting damages caused by the crisis. Uh, they don't see a significant fall in potential output. I've put here uh, CBO estimates, but even though CBO estimates are probably relatively pessimistic with respect to what the administration considers is the uh, situation. Now, in Europe, we are uh, much more pessimistic. Uh, we're pessimistic in the euro area. I've put the estimate by the Commission of the uh, potential output loss, uh, but even more in the UK, where the, the new Office of Budget Responsibility uh, has uh, prepared forecasts uh, that uh, uh, results in, comparing 2015, a loss of almost 9% uh, uh, of, uh, of GDP uh, compared to pre-crisis uh, trend. So this is, this is a very significant difference, uh, this uh, uh, degree to which there is supply-side optimism versus supply-side pessimism. And obviously here, uncertainty is absolutely major. And an indication of the uncertainty is the graph at the bottom, which gives the estimates by the Commission of the 2007 <laughs> gap as uh, these uh, estimates were published since 2007 uh, until the most recent estimate. And what you see here is that the, um, in 2007, the Commission started with the estimate that it was a negative output gap for the euro area as a whole in 2007, uh, and then went to, uh, to estimate that it was a 2.5 percentage point of GDP positive output gap. So the revision of the past has been very significant in terms of where we were uh, before the crisis, and this is part of what justifies, obviously, this uh, now difference in perception of the situation on the supply side. And this is uh, bound to have uh, significant implication for, for policy. Uh, can we find good reasons uh, for these differences? Uh, not so much in terms of the capital stock. Investment evolutions are, are broadly uh, similar. Um, the unemployment explanation, the labor market explanation are uh, probably something we could uh, consider uh, uh, a relevant explanation for the euro area, yeah, and actually that's consistent with the estimates of uh, evolution of the, of the structural unemployment, but not for the UK. And essentially we uh, uh, come to then the, the TFP, the total factor of productivity, um, where we've seen this uh, significant contrast uh, in the uh, years since the crisis, but the question is whether it's going to be lasting. Uh, so our take is that the actual differences uh, uh, are uh, certainly there, but they are probably smaller <coughs> than uh, estimated by policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic. So there is a, a dimension of perception that goes beyond the fact. Um, which uh, that's just a summary of what what I've said, and in the interest of time, let me skip it. This table uh, that's moving to to monetary policy now. Uh, we're starting from the 
um, uh, the, the institutional constraints. What is remarkable is that uh, on the face of it, the institutional constraints, if you look at the mandates of the central bank, are not uh, significantly di different. Uh, what uh, uh, in, the, in the mandate where the most uh, difference are, are obviously this uh, well-known difference as regards the, uh, the mandate, uh, the, the dual mandate of the, of the, of the Fed uh, versus the European uh, central banks, and, but all the rest uh, is essentially uh, financial stability. Now, how uh, uh, has um, uh, the combination of institutional constraint and, and <coughs> affected policies during the crisis? Well, those are the, the well-known uh, data on policy rates and, and balance sheets. Uh, so very similar reactions qualitatively, even though quantitatively the balance sheet of the uh, ECB expanded less than the balance sheet of the Fed and the Bank of England. This, in part, is, is due to uh, change in the money uh, multiplier, which are not the same, so you should discount that. So in the, in the uh, crisis, uh, there were very similar reactions. Post-crisis, what uh, uh, we're seeing is that um, the uh, um, appetite for exit is not the same, and this is very much perceived by markets. Uh, here we, we, we report market expectation of policy rates, and that indicate uh, an earlier uh, expected exit on the euro area side uh, than uh, certainly on the, on the US side and uh, to some extent on the UK side. And uh, here uh, clearly we are in the debate of the, of the day about the willingness to contemplate quantitative easing, which is there in the US, which is there in the UK, and which is not there in uh, the euro area. The uh, question is why. Uh, here there are two competing explanations, or perhaps complementary explanation. One is the reading of the economic situation, and that goes back to my previous point about uh, the supply side and the, and the demand side. The other one is the constraint that doesn't come from explicitly the mandate, but comes with the relationship with government. Clearly the ECB relationship <coughs> with governments is more uneasy than that of uh, the, uh, the Fed or the Bank of England for reasons that have to do with the, the history of the uh, construction of, of monetary union. Um, and uh, the fragmentation on the, on the government side among different national governments. Uh, fiscal policy. Um, fiscal policy, um, the initial conditions uh, before the crisis were not that different. Uh, what is clearly different now is the outlook, and here, uh, well, if we look at what is the expected tightening, that goes back to what Marco said about uh, the, the tightening in the euro area and in Germany. Uh, consistent with what he said, uh, the tightening is uh, as ex measured from the announced uh, plans by national governments. Uh, well, is the order of, of the order of magnitude of one percentage point of GDP per year in the next two years which is not the uh, extremely aggressive um, uh, tightening that is sometimes depicted. Where the tightening is aggressive is in the UK, uh, where uh, the plans for consolidation are much, much more aggressive. Well, on the US side, obviously, you know, it all depends on the Bush tax cuts and the, and the further stimulus. So I think the best I could do is to put uh, an NA in my table. Uh, but, but clearly, we know that uh, uh, the discussion here is uh, much more about uh, what uh, should be, whether there should be uh, an additional stimulus to compensate for the, for the mechanical end of it and what should be done with the Bush tax cuts, but, uh, but clearly we're not uh, in the uh, same type of attitude. Um, are there good reasons for having different uh, views on the uh, fiscal policy going forward? Uh, is, it the, is the fiscal space uh, uh, different? Uh, we can uh, uh, use available estimates of the fiscal space. I've used here uh, the uh, recent paper by uh, Jonathan Ostry and uh, colleagues about uh, what, the, uh, what the fiscal space ba based on the, on the reaction function of a primary deficit to, to the debt. And here it comes out that uh, fiscal space in the US is certainly uh, relatively low compared to a number of, uh, of European countries. So that shouldn't be a good explanation. What uh, uh, is more favorable to the US is if we look at the very long-term outlook, uh, the implication of aging. And here we've used the, the euro area uh, indicator of the implication for aging, of aging for 
um, uh, for public finances and here the, the US is in a better situation. Uh, the difference in terms of tax gap is of the order of magnitude of 1.5% of GDP, which is significant but uh, not uh, as large as it should uh, could uh, explain all the differences. So um, differences here in uh, um, in attitudes, uh, no, not explained by fiscal space, perhaps a, a bit by demography, but probably also by uh, other considerations uh, like perception of the of the risk on, on, on bond markets and the European fragmentation that certainly matters. Um, so different uh, type, type of, uh, of explanation, non-exclusive, demand perceived supply constraint, institutional factor, political economy, and as I said, U UK standing in between, which uh, may uh, explain why, um, uh, what, what the role will help, help sort out the role of um, institutional versus economic explanations. I need to speed up. Sorry, I went up. Um, what, um, uh, to conclude, what are the, the consequences? Uh, it, there are good reasons for having different policies if the, um, if the situations are different, if the priorities are different. Uh, so uh, the first uh, is that you know, the shock was symmetric. The aftershock may not be as symmetric. Uh, and uh, so these are justification for different policies. What we uh, say in the paper is that we're not entirely sure that all these differences are, are entirely genuine and that maybe there are more perceptions, there are more uh, constraints that uh, just exclusively uh, uh, differences in the uh, economic situation require different uh, responses. Also, we recognize that they are. Uh, the next question then is, uh, should we uh, worry, uh, and is there still a, a strong need for, for coordination in this phase? Um, the reason why there was so much coordination during the crisis is that the nature of the, of the spillovers, the nature of the shock, called for uh, coordination much more than in normal times. Are we out of the, of the exceptional times? Uh, are we back to the normal times where the quantum of coordination is less? We, what we're saying is that uh, we're still in conditions where uh, uh, goods market spillover are, st are, are dominant, which uh, justifies uh, coordination, that there are risks uh, uh, on, the, on the trade front of divergence uh, you know, in macro going to uh, exchange rate development and then leading uh, to, to, to trade protection pressures, that the interaction with global adjustment that Fred emphasized in the, in the initial remarks is still a reason why the US and the EU should not go in a direction where their conflicts uh, prevent them from having a common attitude vis-a-vis -vis the global adjustment and specifically vis-a-vis -vis China. And, and last, that you know, there might be some learning in looking at what is the policy of, of your neighbor and what are the reasons why uh, there are, is a different perception. So we, are, we would be worried <coughs> if coordination would end, and that's why we're proposing, and I'm ending here, a quantum of coordination, uh, which uh, would combine avoiding policy gear to, to depreciation and a, a commitment to uh, avoiding unilateral intervention with IMF monitoring. Uh, second, uh, we call for an independent assessment of the fiscal space, and that also could be a natural role for the, for the IMF. We think that um, the uh, medium term, the lack of a medium term consolidation uh, program in the US, the lack of a fiscal framework that would uh, uh, you know, lend uh, credibility to, the, uh, to the, the, the fiscal policy is worrying and that uh, having credible uh, medium term program put to, to parliament, voted by, by parliament would be a, a significant plus. And finally, uh, uh, we uh, think that uh, all those conditions would uh, allow dealing with China in a multilateral rather than in a bilateral context. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting paper with many ideas. I will not um, discuss all the arguments, but uh, only a few concentrating on monetary policy, given that that's my uh, comparative advantage. And I would like to make three main observations. 
The first relates to uh, the role that underlying economic conditions play in explaining uh, policy differences across the Atlantic. And uh, the, the analysis has been uh, done very thoroughly, but I would like to add one element which, is, uh, which may not be uh, fully publicized. And it, this refers to the transmission of monetary policy, uh, especially after a bubble economy. And in particular, the flow of credits to the private sector in the euro area and uh, uh, in the US. And there seems to be differences uh, still at, at, at the present stage. If you consider the overall amount of lending to the private sector, this chart refers to the euro area, you see that um, so the, the blue line is GDP. The red is the financing to household, both, line, both bank and capital market, uh, which is more relevant for the green one, which is uh, uh, corporation. You see that uh, there has been, never been a negative territory and there is a pickup already for uh, a couple of, of quarters and even more if you look at the households. Now if you look, so this is the picture for the euro area, if you look at the US, uh, the credit to household and the corporate sector has been in negative territory for quite some time. So this may, uh, may be explained both by demand and supply uh, factors. And as the authors have shown, before the crisis, the, the U.S. household and corporates had a higher debt level than the euro area counterparts. And uh, so they have to deleverage uh, much more than the, in the euro area. And also on the supply side, possibly U.S. banks also have to deleverage much more than, uh, than in the euro area. So this difference in the flow of financing to the private sector may explain uh, the different techniques also that have been followed in the implementation of monetary policy on the two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and you may also explain the results, difference in results that, that have, we have achieved. Uh, to be sure, the uh, ability to anchor inflation expectations uh, uh, in, the, in the euro area has enabled, uh, you see the difference between the real long-term rates, uh, in the euro area uh, we have been able to, to maintain quite uh, low real interest rates because of the anchoring of inflation expectations at, uh, at close to two. Second point I would like to make is about the lessons that central banks have to take from the past uh, to guide the future monetary policy. And uh, Jean and, and Adam uh, cite in particular three episodes uh, that we should take into account going forward. The Japanese depression, uh, the Great Depression, the Japanese deflation, and then all the analysis of post-crisis uh, 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 periods. And um, I would say certainly these are very important periods and, um, and we have to look at that, but uh, considering at, at these periods, what are the lessons? And uh, at least I would take three main lessons. First, after a financial crisis uh, and a house bubbling burst, uh, a bubble burst, um, well, growth potential is impaired, tends to be impaired and possibly even reduced for some time. And if you look at the uh, major financial international institutions, this is uh, what they include in their projections. Second point, monetary policy can certainly smooth in a transition to a new steady state, but it's very difficult uh, after a shock like this one to pull the economy back to where it was before the shock, uh, because the situation before the shock was, was not a stable equilibrium. And third, that the recapitalization and restructuring of the banking system is, is very important, maybe even more important than monetary policy in avoiding a credit crunch. Now these are the lessons for past episode, but in my view there is another period we should have to take into account to guide our future policy, which is the period before the crisis. I think if we understand what happened before the crisis, we may avoid to make the same mistakes. And I think that uh, this crisis has challenged all our thinking in economies, but also central bankers. And we have to, we cannot be immune from a, an exercise of rethinking what has worked and what has not worked in our analytical thinking. And um, if we are not afraid to look critically at the past, I, I would mention a few lessons uh, uh, from, uh, from the past uh, uh, decade before the crisis. First lesson is that, uh, to be sure, the growth recorded uh, in those countries, uh, in those advanced economies which experience current account deficits, this growth, that kind of growth, I have to say, both in Europe and in, across the Atlantic, that growth was not sustainable. Uh, so if policies continue to aim at the same time of growth, at the same type of growth, 
we may end up with the same imbalances. Second lesson, that very low level of interest rates for a prolonged period of time can result in a misallocation of resources and encourage restaking the fuel asset price bubbles. And I think there is now quite some evidence, if you look at, so at this chart and at the next one, that there is a strong correlation between the level of interest rate and restaking attitude by the banking sector. So it's not fair, I think, for central banks to just say that they had nothing to do with the crisis and this was all due to bad regulation. Third point, uh, the view that monetary policy should not look at financial market conditions and should only intervene to counter the effects of the bursting of the bubble once the bubble explodes, what was called the German put, the Greenspan put, uh, actually proved not to be right. Fourth lesson that I take, uh, that interest rates were kept too low for too long before the crisis, mainly on account of fears that the economy would enter a Japanese-style deflation, fears that turn out to have been exaggerated and probably wrong. So the so-called risk management type monetary policy aimed at uh, avoiding deflation is not without risk, and we have to be very careful. Fifth lesson, monetary policy cannot, cannot by itself transform a jobless recovery into a job-generating recovery. If anything, keeping the cost of capital very low may encourage capital-intensive investment rather than labor-intensive uh, capital investment. Sixth lesson, core inflation is not a good predictor of headline inflation, uh, nor of underlying inflationary pressures emerging in a global economy. Seventh uh, lesson, it's very difficult to measure output gaps. Uh, if you look at the past, the blue line is the measure of output gap in 2003, in April 2003. And you see that in April 2003, the output gap for 2003 was about minus, between minus two and minus three, so minus two and a half. This is the US output gap. After, after a few years, even before the major crisis, so in April 2008, it turned out that the output gap was half percent of GDP. So measures of output gap change, and it's very dangerous, therefore, to calibrate monetary policy on the basis of this variable. So I think if we want to repeat the mistakes of the past, we have to keep these lessons in mind. Third point I would like to make, uh, and final one, it relates to what Jean uh, called uneasy in the paper is called problematic relationship with the, sense the central bank and government. And uh, according to, to the paper, the ECB had a more problematic relationship with governments than other central bank. I would like to say that uh, the institutional framework uh, underlying the ECB does not prevent the ECB from taking uh, non-conventional measures uh, that other central banks have taken. Uh, the ECB did not embark on some of these uh, measures, in particular quantitative easing, uh, not because we could not do so or because of our uneasy relationship with, with governments, but because we did not consider that to be an appropriate instrument of conducting monetary policy. The non-conventional measures we adopted, which is a fixed rate full allotment in particular, uh, was based on the fact that in the euro area, the transmission <coughs> mechanism of monetary policy is different, possibly, from that of the US, uh, and relies mainly on the banking system. And as I've shown before, it seems to have worked. <coughs> so the, these measures that we, our way of uh, injecting liquidity in the system has nothing to do, I think, with uh, our relationship with the government, but with our way of uh, considering most effective tools. I have to say that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, um, we, we have decided to s uh, selectively purchase uh, uh, assets, uh, but for a very specific and very uh, targeted. Uh, um. But this, I mean, leads me to more general consideration that uh, embarking on large-scale purchases of government bonds may, may affect the relationship between central banks and the fiscal authority. The problem with that is, I'm not sure then, uh, when such a relationship can be characterized as problematic or unproblematic. And uh, I had the impression that, uh, reading the paper, that a problematic relationship is one in which monetary and fiscal policy are distinct. And the unproblematic one is when they, they merge together. 
so I, you know, I naturally ask, uh, reading the paper, where is the problem if monetary policy is kept distinct from uh, fiscal policy and cannot be manipulated by the fiscal authorities to solve budgetary problems? Maybe it's a problem for the fiscal authorities because they would like to use the instrument of monetary policy to inflate away the fiscal problems and have instead to resort to fiscal measures that are subject to parliamentary approval, are transparent, and are democratic, and all citizens are able to judge and assess. So it seems to me that uh, this is not a problem, in Europe at least, to have a distinct central bank and fiscal authority, and uh, the fact that fiscal problems are not solved through the inflation tax or by keeping the interest rate on public debt at very low level is not considered to be a problem in Europe. And uh, actually the European population, for the European population, the role of the central bank uh, has to be distinct from that of the fiscal authorities and monetary policy should firmly remain in the hands of the central bank and this is why we have a treaty actually to avoid that think these things are, are changed. And this is why actually in Europe and in European countries, in Greece, Ireland, Spain, France, Germany, the governments are adopting budgetary policies in full awareness of the fact that they cannot count on the inflation tax to solve their fiscal challenges, uh, challenges that uh, we all have uh, across the Atlantic. So <coughs> we don't consider that to be a problem, and I think European citizens consider that to be a problem. Final points, let me say that I'm very happy to participate finally to a transatlantic relationship uh, uh, a conference in which we don't spend time uh, discussing how irrelevant these relationships are. <laughs> uh, actually, they, at least in the monetary field, they seem to be relevant, uh, maybe because these are the only ones existing um, um, relationship. And we are dealing, uh, we, we have a, a lot of attention to, the, uh, to, to what uh, I would call minor differences between uh, policies, actually, as the authors say, across the Atlantic, <coughs> while uh, divergences may be much bigger with other parts of the world. And the paradox of uh, major emerging market economies uh, asking actually for greater say in global governments, uh, uh, rightly so, but at the same time uh, shying away from a responsibility in monetary matters is not capturing uh, sufficient attention and maybe is, um, as was mentioned, uh, uh, um, the elephant in the room. So I think we need to devote more attention also to these much bigger divergences and to the consequences that they may have for uh, our recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this paper. I think it's an interesting, important one and uh, gives a lot of food for thought. Um, in the paper, the, there is a discussion of the comparative response, uh, not just of the US and the Eurozone, but also of the United Kingdom to the financial crisis, you know, both the response and how exit might be. But in some sense, uh, my view of it is that probably a more granular kind of analysis would have distinguished uh, within uh, the Eurozone among different types of countries. Uh, you had countries like Spain and Ireland that had a housing bubble, like the US and UK. And you had countries like Portugal, Greece and Italy that had fiscal problems but did not have a housing bubble. Um, so there are many dimensions in which actually the things can be sliced. You know, if you ask yourself, take this group of countries, which one of them had a housing bubble that implies different responses? You had in the US, you had in UK, you had it in Spain and Ireland, but you did not have it in the rest of the Eurozone. If you ask yourself, uh, uh, were fiscal problems severe even before the crisis? Uh, the answer, even within the Eurozone, is that uh, there was in Portugal, in Greece, and maybe in Italy, fiscal problems, while the fiscal problems of Spain or Ireland derive from the bust uh, of the financial crisis and the housing bubble. And if you look at the issue of current account imbalances, for example, again, the US, UK, and the periphery of the Eurozone had uh, relatively larger current account deficits, while in the case of Germany, in the core of the Eurozone, you had current account surpluses. So in, in some sense, what I'm trying to say is that an analysis would have to consider also these aspects uh, and within the Eurozone, the differences between the kind of a cyclical and structural conditions of different countries. Uh, second point I think that's important here is that uh, the paper stresses the role of, uh, you know, monetary and fiscal response. I think that the third element of the 
response to the crisis that could be fleshed out in more detail is the question of uh, the backstopping, ring fencing, uh, if, you know, if you don't want to call it bailout of banks and other financial institutions. And even within uh, the monetary and the fiscal response, uh, we can distinguish between traditional monetary and fiscal response, traditional monetary response being cutting interest rates, traditional fiscal response being raising spending or reducing taxes or making transfer payments. But in these economic and financial crises, non-traditional responses became very important. On the monetary side, combinations of quantitative easing, credit easing, a land of last resort support, uh, of the financial system, um, kind of uh, even other forms of backstopping of the financial system. And as I'll point out, uh, this support coming from monetary policy had elements of liquidity support and financial stability support, but also some quasi-fiscal activities. And for what concerns fiscal policy, of course, in addition to traditional fiscal policies, we had non-traditional fiscal policies in the form of a variety of forms of call them bailouts of either banks and financial institutions, but also households and even corporates. Uh, that leads me to the point that when we think about uh, the kind of a backstop uh, and enhancing of the financial system, both monetary policy authority and central banks and fiscal authorities were involved in these activities. So the traditional distinction between fiscal mon and monetary policy becomes fuzzy when central bank one have a financial stability role to when effectively they end up being involved, whether they like it or not, into quasi-fiscal activities. And I will argue that even the ECB, in spite of what it said, has been getting involved into those kind of activities. Now, if I think about uh, this question of financial stability, I think that the first point that comes to mind is that uh, central banks were not created to stabilize or smooth inflation and growth relative to some target. Central banks were originally created because you had bank runs and you had uh, provision of liquidity support to avoid bank runs. You know, the Fed was created in 1913 after the 1907 kind of bank run and panic. So whether central banks have an explicit role in financial stability or not, effectively they play that huge role. You know, remember in the, in the paper there's a chart that says that the ECB, technically speaking, doesn't have an explicit uh, kind of financial stability role. But if you think about what the ECB did, uh, the first one, the first institution to start doing non-conventional monetary policy was actually the ECB on August 9, 2007, when there was this sudden shock of liquidity in the interbank market and massively intervened before even the Fed, and initially there was even some criticism. Uh, if you look at the ECB response, you know, base money has more than doubled in the United States and the UK, but it's gone up uh, by more than 70% even in the Eurozone. Maybe it's not in the form of QEs, maybe it's in the form of support of the financial system, but that's very unconventional. And even in the recent kind of bailout of Greece, uh, uh, part of the solution was, of course, a European stabilization fund, but uh, the ECB was forced to be involved in the purchase of uh, the government bonds of member states, and certainly the support that is given to banks through their repo operations implies purchases of the bonds of member states, those that are in trouble. So whether you like it or not, whether it's explicit or not, uh, that role of financial stability has been taken by every central bank, regardless of what the official mandate might be. Uh, the additional point in this context, I think, is that most of the central banks, whether they liked it or not, have been involved into quasi-fiscal activities. Uh, those quasi-fiscal activities may be more clear when you do quantitative easing and you are purchasing government bonds in a massive scale, like the US has done, like the UK has done. That's effectively, whether you like it or not, <coughs> monetization of fiscal deficits. To me, that's a quasi-fiscal role. It happens when you do credit easing and you buy even kind of more exotic or more risky kind of private sector assets that subject the central bank to losses. You know, in the US, the Fed with the maiden lanes supporting AIG and Bear Stearns took that type of a fiscal and credit risk. Uh, there is even an element of it when you do traditional lender last resort support, because if you don't know whether the financial system is just illiquid or is insolvent, uh, massive purchases of illiquid or kind of uh, risky assets of the financial system also lead to kind of quasi-fiscal activities. 
And I would even argue that even the traditional monetary policy of having <coughs> policy rates close to zero is effectively a form of quasi-fiscal uh, policy. You know, that has allowed banks to have a very large net interest margin. It has taxed effectively the household sector is earning zero on its deposits and its saving. This implies a huge subsidy to the financial system that is being recapitalized through essentially zero interest rate policy. It traditionally is not considered as fiscal policy, but when you have <coughs> zero rates for many years, that effectively is a transfer of income and wealth <coughs> from the household sector to the financial system. That's a cause of fiscal activity has been <coughs> undertaken by central banks. Now, if we think about these uh, backstop or bailout of the banks and the financial system, as I pointed out, those activities have been undertaken both by monetary authorities and by fiscal authorities. If you think about it, during this financial crisis, every single piece, both of the asset side and of the liability side of the financial system, has been supported by either the government or central bank. If you think about the liability side of the financial system, you have capital, you have insured deposits, and you have other uninsured kind of debt of the financial system, and whether through further deposit insurance, whether through private or public recapitalization of the banking system, and whether through guarantees of those unsecured claims of the financial system, massive support in the US, in Europe, <coughs> in, uh, in, uh, in uh, other countries being provided. And on the side of the asset side of the financial system, a combination of lender last resort support market making of last resort, takeover or guarantees of bad assets is implied also either central banks or fiscal authorities supporting uh, this financial system. Now, if you think about the response to the crisis, uh, has been different, of course. Uh, it was discussed in the paper. The reason why the ECB has been more cautious, cutting rates less, doing less QE, is a combination of their belief that the problem in the Eurozones have to do with essentially structural rigidities in the labor markets or in the economy, meaning the look at supply curve in their view is inelastic, so increasing demand doesn't make any difference for output, and of course greater concerns and primacy of the inflation target. In part, that response might be also due to the no bailout clause that implies that essentially you don't want to fiscalize, monetize fiscal deficits. Uh, the question is whether uh, the exit view in principle is different between the ECB and the US and whether in practice is going to be different. In principle is different. The ECB is saying that we want to exit soon, maybe because they worry about inflation, maybe because they worry about other asset bubble, maybe because they worry about not signaling that they want to bail out the financial system. But in reality, uh, with a lag, even the ECB is going to be forced to do more quantitative easing. It's going to do it after the US, after Japan, after the UK. But I think there is significant risk of either a double dip or continuation of the first dip in the periphery of the Eurozone, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Ireland, you name it. The Euro is going towards 140, and that's becoming painful. And you might have soon enough a stock market correction. So at some point, whether the ECB likes it or not, is going to be forced unless it wants to let the Euro appreciate further to do that response. In the case of the United States, uh, the monetary policy response has been more aggressive because Traditionally, that's the way it's done in the U.S., to try to get an economy out of a recession. There's also more support of a fiscal policy response, because if you don't believe in an inelastic uh, supply curve, then uh, aggregate demand increases on the fiscal side helps you. And you, in the U.S., there is also the view that consumers are less Ricardian than in the Eurozone. But even in the United States, given the rise in unemployment is becoming structural, unemployment benefits are becoming, like Europe, more permanent. So I think that aspect of it is, is changing. And the additional observation I'll make here is that massive quantitative easing is equivalent to effects intervention. If you're trying to devalue away uh, through growth, uh, it's effectively a form of intervention. It's not formal intervention, but that leads to the question of these currency or intervention tensions, if you want to kind of call them uh, kind of wars. Um, on the fiscal response, I would say the following points that are important. There is this gap between what the US claims to be doing and what the Eurozone is claiming to be doing. But even in the United States, there's going to be a meaningful amount of fiscal drag given unchanged fiscal policy. 
and in parts of the Eurozone like Germany, the fiscal austerity is not front-loaded, so maybe the substantial differences are smaller than otherwise. Some of the responses, in my view, are driven on whether country can monetize those fiscal deficits or not. That's something you can do in the US and UK. You cannot do it in the Eurozone. Some of them depend on whether the bond market vigilantes have already woken up, so that they have in the periphery of the Eurozone, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Italy, Ireland. They did not in the UK or in Germany, and therefore in those cases, front-loaded fiscal consolidation has to do more with political decision to front-load it, rightly or wrongly. Uh, my concern about the front-loaded is these results from the recent IMF study suggesting that however necessary fiscal consolidation in the short term, raising taxes and cutting spending has a negative effect on growth, it doesn't crowd in growth, it crowds it out. And if everybody does it, then what's going to be the outlook for, for uh, you know, economic outlook in the, in the global economy? So to just summarize, I think that there are many important points here. But the final point I'd like to make is the following one. Uh, the financial crisis was caused by too much debt and leverage in the private sector and has now led to a massive re-leveraging of the public sector. Automatic stabilizer, Keynesian fiscal response, socializing of the private losses. And now in the countries like Greece, and soon enough I worry about Ireland or Portugal, where the national governments are in trouble, now you have supranational governments, be it the Eurozone, the IMF, EU, that are bailing out the sovereigns. You know, at some point you cannot kick the can down the road, right? There's not going to be anybody out of Mars coming to bail out the IMF or the Eurozone if trouble occurs. So the point is, is this uh, response optimal or not? If you have excessive debt problems relative to your income, you can try to grow yourself out of those problems, but growth is going to be anemic in the Eurozone, US, and advanced economies. That doesn't solve your problem. You can save more, but if you save more in the private sector, you have the paradox of thrift output falls and you have a dynamic of, output of debt that is destabilizing and the same thing happens also on the fiscal side. There is a paradox of fiscal austerity. If it's too much front load it leads to a recession then you don't resolve your problems. You can inflate yourself out of it by debasing real debt of the private public sector. It has its own cost even if the US might be starting to consider that, that's a difference relative to the Eurozone. But if you don't want to do any of these things, and you have too much debt, eventually you need debt default or debt restructurings of households, of banks and financial institutions, of local governments or central sovereigns, or even of countries if they have too much foreign debt. And if you don't do it, then the other options might be the basement of your currency or inflation. So at some point we'll see how the policy response between different countries is going to imply different types of fiscal adjustment, different types of inflation taxes, or debt restructuring of one sort or another. Thanks. The, uh, the uh, paper by uh, Pisani, Ferry, and, uh, and uh, Posen is uh, extremely interesting, <coughs> uh, not least in uh, describing and quantifying uh, the policies that have been uh, undertaken in, in uh, Europe and the United States. There's a lot of talk always about uh, policies that are out of control and so forth, but it's good to see the numbers. and. Uh, and to get some issues put very squarely on the table. Uh, among the issues put very squarely on the table is uh, why is US unemployment so much uh, higher when output behavior is not so different? Uh, the answer that's given is, uh, well, American employers lay off people more easily. It's a very big difference if that's, uh, that's the whole story. Uh, there's a question of uh, U.S. fiscal policy versus European uh, with the claim that Americans are more uh, Keynesian. I don't think it's Americans that are more Keynesian. I think it's the administration that's more Keynesian uh, than administrations abroad and the uh, level of, uh, of uh, opposition uh, to that proposition within the political system is part of what's complicated uh, 
getting a, a, uh, an American fiscal policy that promises plausible, uh, plausible uh, adjustment and uh, down, uh, down the road. And then there's the policy coordination question on which the uh, paper focuses, which is how did the uh, London consensus become the Toronto divergence? Well, the answer actually is pretty simple, and I think you could guess it at the time, which was in London it was very clear that everybody needed to do approximately the same thing uh, in their own interests. I think what was a bit more interesting, or excuse me, what was more interesting uh, was that the, uh, the banking sector uh, consensus on how to deal with a financial crisis, I think, was more of a uh, more of a, a, a policy coordination in the sense that uh, people didn't quite know what to do, and uh, the G20 uh, led or certainly heavily influenced by the UK approach did develop a common approach to this issue, which I think uh, they didn't have uh, before they started. And then there are questions, this ends up with uh, Europe-US coordination, what ought to be done. And the, uh, the answer is basically not very much. Um, don't intervene in the foreign exchange markets. Uh, let the IMF uh, examine the issue and tell you whether the exchange rate is approximately right. Uh, I don't think uh, there's a whole lot of desire on either side to intervene in the foreign exchange market in any case by either uh, the U.S. authorities or the uh, or the European authorities, and so my I guess is it isn't going to, it isn't going to happen, and the desired coordination will take place as uh, suggested, namely not to act. Uh, to uh, on the fiscal side. <coughs> the uh, implicit or explicit suggestion is uh, don't, uh, don't uh, tighten too quickly but, uh, and use the IMF's calculations of how much fiscal room countries have uh, to, uh, to tell you how far you can go, provided, and here comes the next part, co condition three, there are medium-term fiscal consolidation programs put in place. And then the final one is a sort of uh, injunction, which I guess we all have to take. Don't let pessimistic, pessimistic expectations become self-fulfilling. Uh, don't accept things which you may be able to uh, change. I think on the, uh, I'd like to make a comment on the fiscal adjustment uh, issue and then turn to uh, the foreign exchange issues briefly. On the, uh, on the fiscal adjustment consolidation programs, uh, the, uh, as, as was just said by Nouriel, the uh, British program is not as front-loaded as they make it sound. And that's good, because it shouldn't be. Uh, and not much is going to happen this year, or wasn't going to happen since the uh, government was elected. Most of the adjustment is down the road. It's bigger than the others, but it's, uh, it's not, as we saw on the slide, but it's not massive. I think the key difference, and it really is a difference, is that it is very hard, having seen what happened in, uh, in the U.S. in getting the fiscal expansion policy accepted, to commit to anything. I don't know what exactly the commitment would, uh, would take, that we're going to straighten out the budget in uh, five years on this particular path when the political process is nothing like that of a British government, uh, which uh, despite having a coalition uh, can say with some credibility that they plan on uh, straightening out the budget over a three or four year horizon and you might even, you, you can probably believe that uh, we just don't know what the politics is and how it would be done uh, in the Congress. And if at a time when uh, it looked like the bottom was falling out of the world, it still took so much effort to get a program which, uh, you know, they always say you don't want to see uh, how 
how uh, countries make uh, either sausages or budgets, but uh, sometimes you don't mind eating the sausages. Uh, eating this particular budget was a little harder. It wasn't very nice, and uh, it wasn't a, a, a very optimal uh, fiscal program, and who knows what's coming down the road. So I think it's just harder for the U.S., and uh, being harder at a time when the budget deficit is, is massive, uh, being more difficult to commit to an adjustment, uh, probably has an impact on the effectiveness of uh, a fiscal pro uh, policy. I know it is said, because uh, I read the New York Times, <laughs> that, um, that uh, there's no evidence to think that what's going to happen down the road really matters. Long-term interest rates are very low. Uh, therefore, the markets aren't looking at uh, what happens down the road, so you don't have to say anything about what happens down the road. Well, I sort of like that story, except it comes from people who keep telling you that the markets don't know what they're doing and you should pay no attention uh, to market expectations. And we do have theories which tell you these things matter. Uh, and it does matter how you uh, look ahead at what's uh, going to happen and you don't know. And we used to have a saying in the 1990s, the markets react uh, much too slowly, but when they react, they react excessively. Now, this was apropos financial crises. And uh, you've really got to take that uh, into account. So I think this sort of view that, well, open-ended as long as as long as the interest rates stay low, you're, you have all the freedom in the world to expand the deficit or to expand government spending is, uh, is problematic, uh, certainly for anybody planning over uh, any horizon, any lengthy horizon. Let me turn now to uh, the foreign exchange uh, aspects. I think the uh, volatility in the euro dollar rate is impressive. Uh, we. Uh, it was not so long ago that the euro was headed for one with probability one. <laughs> and uh, it not only didn't get there, uh, two days ago it was headed for 150 with probability one, and now it's going down again. So uh, who knows uh, exactly wh where we're going we're gonna to get. And th that's very volatile. It is uh, surprising, possibly less surprising than I find it in light of the fact that the economies are reasonably closed, that this hasn't led to a great deal of noise about, I mean, I'm not saying that various policymakers aren't complaining, but you don't hear the, the problem of the exchange rate as being quoted as the predominant problem of the, uh, the Europe-US uh, relationship and of uh, the Europe-US uh, uh, policy coordination. You do certainly hear it as the predominant problem of the emerging market and developing countries. Uh, every one of them is upset about the capital inflows, about the appreciations uh, that are taking place, and um, they're also thinking about what to do about it. Now, the level of the individual countries, well, there are basically only two things you can do, or three. One, you can explain that fiscal policy should be adjusted uh, to deal with the inflow, essentially reduce the interest rate by fiscal contraction so you don't, uh, you don't get so much money coming in. I think that's a great story. The fiscal policy that I'm aware of has enough trouble just getting itself straight uh, as to not be willing. Uh, I wouldn't prefer it to take on the exchange rate issue in addition to if, if we could get it to be stable, which it is, and looking to the long term, I'd be very satisfied, and I think most countries uh, would be. So that leaves the other two things, which are intervention and uh, capital controls. And we've seen them happening, and we're seeing them happening on a massive, uh, on a massive scale. Um, and uh, every day we follow these things for reasons uh, you may appreciate, we intervene as well. And every day, uh, some other countries imposing capital controls. One day it was three countries, uh, one in Asia, two in Latin America, and it's just happening. Now, we don't have a good theory as to why countries shouldn't do this, except for the one that says it doesn't work. But if you leave that aside 
and say it probably does work uh, in the short run, and that's what people are concerned about. Uh, we don't have a good theory of, of uh, why they shouldn't do it. I understand that they shouldn't do it because there's a global uh, adjustment mechanism which takes place. And they have to contribute to the global adjustment. Well, they're contributing already because there's a global recession going on, which they didn't start. So they think, uh, well, gee, we gave it the office. And then, boom, in comes this capital which says you're also going to contribute uh, by adding a tax on exports uh, and a subsidy for imports to the adjustment mechanism. Uh, they may say, well, it's difficult enough as it is. We don't need that. And we're going to try and do something else. We have not solved this problem. Uh, I'm out of time, so I can't solve it in the next minute. Uh, <laughs> We haven't solved it for 60 years, and we haven't solved it for 100 years because it was the interwar uh, issue uh, that, uh, in part, the fund uh, was set up to deal with. It's clear what we need. We cannot assume that countries will act against their own interests, even in the relevant political horizon of two years. Uh, and we just shouldn't. What we need is a system in which when countries do what's good for themselves, they're acting in a way that reduces, uh, that, that, uh, that is good for the system, which means we need a set of incentives, and I don't mean, I, I don't quite know what they are. Uh, and nobody knows because we haven't yet figured out how to persuade the uh, surplus countries to adjust. But we need a set of incentives that uh, makes countries do uh, what is good for the system when they uh, do what is good for themselves in the relevant uh, political horizon. By and large, the WTO does that. But the WTO issues are very small relative to the uh, scale of the exchange rate problem. And I've heard people talking about applying WTO procedures uh, in the case of exchange rates. I think these issues are much bigger than what you could get out of a WTO uh, dispute uh, get settled through a WTO dispute uh, mechanism, but somewhere down the road we either need, we need accepted rules of the road, which we don't have, uh, and when we get and when we get those accepted, it's going to take a long time to get them, uh, and until then we'll have pressures of the sort we have now, and which are essentially driven by the fact that a lot of countries think they're being asked to take an an ab an excessive share of the adjustment burden because it isn't being shared among all the countries in the system. And of course, we're talking in to a considerable extent, but not only uh, about the role of the, uh, of the uh, Chinese exchange rate in the adjustment uh, mechanism. And that is still out there. And it was part of the reason for this crisis. And uh, whereas the financial system is being fixed, this one isn't being. Thank you. Thanks, Fred, for inviting me here uh, for this um, uh, great conference. And uh, let me add my um, sort of uh, kudos to the paper, excellent paper. Enjoyed reading it, covers it most with a great deal of analytical rigor and comprehensively, and suggests some way forward. Uh, let me uh, sort of make uh, essentially five points in the 10 minutes that I have. Uh, one, uh, from the Indian point of view and from the emerging economies point of view, I, of course, uh, you know, it's clear that any lack of coordination between uh, two blocks which have 50% of the world GDP uh, means a lot of trouble for us. Uh, and and, and that, that trouble uh, really is, the, you know, the in, in one word, if you like, you know, the fear of the P word, you know, protectionism, you know, because if there is lack of coordination and if, this, uh, and if these economies don't uh, get their act together, uh, then, of course, the, the, the reaction would be increasing, uh, you know, protectionism, lack of market access. And for us in India, it would be perhaps come earlier because services are seen to be more high value added jobs and therefore the reaction would start there. 
And I heard Barry Eichen Green's talk yesterday uh, saying that policy convergence is one of the necessary conditions for getting out of a global recession. And if there is no policy convergence, this is the 1930s uh, lesson, and when it doesn't happen, uh, if, and, and there are chances of that, then of course uh, we in India uh, or emerging economies get, get extremely worried. But m apart from protectionism is also the great, greater uncertainty which is introduced in the global environment and which will affect uh, the financial flows clearly. And these will become more volatile and as um, Mr. Fisher just said, uh, we have to be at the end, you know, we have to bear the brunt of it and we don't very often have the uh, policy instruments to be able to do that uh, quite efficiently and that means uh, that we would be in trouble as well. And, but from the Indian point of view, uh, we in a recent book, The Long View from Delhi, <coughs> have taken the view that a U.S. resurgence is critical for us in the next uh, you know, a decade, two decades, decade and a half. And if the lack of policy convergence means that <coughs> U.S. <coughs> has a greater probability of going through a Japan decade, uh, that means for India, much more trouble than for perhaps any other country. Uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, and, and, and compared to, I mean, you know, there's an old saying that when two elephants fight, the grass is trampled, and we are very much the grass, maybe China is not, but we are very much the grass, so we are really concerned. And the final implication, which is really, uh, I think, uh, bodes very well, um, sort of not well, is that this will surely mean the demise of the G20. You know, and, and that's and, and already Raghuram Rajan has been sort of you know predicting it. If this comes to pass, then let's say bye bye to G20 and any ideas of changes in global uh, financial, economic, architecture, governance, etc. And that be bad trouble. So I think we we really appreciate therefore the you know the attempt by uh, Adam and um, Jean to suggest the way forward. And essentially, the way forward they're sort of talking is like about a middle path. You know, which is always very good, saying Europe, you guys have overestimated the loss of uh, you know uh, potential output. Uh, the U.S., uh, you underestimated it. Uh, you, what you're doing, so therefore, Europe, don't tighten as much. Europe, you can, you know, the U.S., please, uh, you can have some, uh, you know, sort of less uh, degree of fiscal stimulus. And I think that's that's probably you know all very well. And uh, the one point, of course, for the U.S. is that any stimulus must be, of course, better targeted. Uh, and, you know, it's not painting bridges and, you know, sort of dropping money from the helicopters, but it's more like, you know, sort of, uh, you know, education, infrastructure, R&D, uh, green technologies. I think that's a fair point and that the paper could have made that extra point about how the U.S. stimulus, uh, you know, could be used. And two, the point that Jeffrey Frankel has been making that uh, the, 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 the current fiscal stimulus must be accompanied with a guarantee of uh, uh, fiscal discipline uh, in the medium term, which I think they make the point uh, also, that, but you know, I think uh, that if you suggest measures as to how that can be achieved, uh, the medium term fiscal consolidation uh, for the U.S. that would add uh, to the paper. Um, the paper suggests that this could be done by the IMF being brought into the play uh, through the mutual assessment process, I suppose. Uh, it's a good idea, but already the mutual assessment process uh, has become uh, not individual country specific. It's become regional. You get grouping countries, you know, with each other. And then it's, I suppose, I think it becomes pretty much irrelevant because you've got to have country specific strategies uh, coming out of the IMS about fiscal space, uh, you know, exchange rate, monetary policy, etc. Unless the, you know, the, the, the recipe is country specific, uh, you know, the, the IMF's, you know, mutual assessment process cannot serve any purpose. And, and the second condition, I think, is that it should be made public. There is no reason for what the IMF finds uh, to remain in the confines of the finance ministers. Uh, it should be uh, out in the public so that the, you know, the people can decide whether the IMF has taken the right view or is, doing the, is suggesting the right remedy. And the third, I think, a suggestion that was made at the CG conference in May, which is that they could, the G20 could, uh, think of uh, you know, establishing a committee of uh, eminent economists, the senior economists, to which the IMF's recommendation could be submitted uh, so that it is depoliticized. The whole thing is depoliticized because IMF is a uh, political uh, creature, so how do you uh, get to the objectivity of it? Maybe that's, uh, that, I think, is a useful uh, suggestion to have. The next uh, sort of suggestion I think uh, I would make is that the paper could have talked about uh, talking, uh, you know, could have talked about how to sort out the imbalances within Europe itself. 
I mean, there are marked imbalances there, and there are some things that some European countries, like Germany, for example, could do, uh, you know, to ease the situation. And also that if there is a fiscal tightening in Europe, it's not, it cannot be, you know, across the board. There are certain spots. You know, which need uh, less fiscal tightening, there are others which need more. So it has to be, I think, as uh, Mr. Rubini said, uh, a more granular approach for Europe. And that has to be uh, sort of, you know, that, that, that would come out quite clearly. And my own suggestion is that Europe could do with a higher inflation target at this, at this point of time. Uh, because with a higher inflation target, I think you would get, if nothing else, a clear sort of certainty, less uncertainty about policy direction in Europe, monetary and fiscal policy, and that might help investment intentions at the moment, which is, I think, in short supply. The capital, you know, is not forthcoming and, 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 and as much as we like. The private sector response is not that large, and I think a slightly higher inflation targeting, which would mean a greater room, as it were, now for investment demand to come up, uh, would help uh, Europe in that sense. Uh, on China, I th clearly you need a multilateral approach uh, to China. My submission from having heard just recently in September and Yong was there, Andrew Sheng, Yu Yongding, Yuan Yuping, several Chinese economists, that it is perhaps counterproductive to go on about the exchange rate in China, the renminbi's exchange rate. Because, you know, the, the political uh, you know, reaction to that is very large. And my, th feel, my thought is that you could approach China uh, through the mutual assessment process and talk to them about the imbalances and the steps that they were going to be taking uh, to redress uh, this huge current account surplus issue and how they were going to absorb it by raising domestic demand, whether it's in the western provinces or the central and in the structural, uh, you know, if, uh, the structural uh, measures that they're going to take to raise domestic demand, which will then reduce the, you know, current, uh, current account surplus and we, and, and then, in sort of implication, have the ex, you know exchange rate effect as well. So I think that's my approach to uh, China that I would suggest to the authors. Uh, on the uh, on, uh, and, and finally, uh, I think uh, there's just a little quibble I have basically uh, on fiscal space. Uh, Spain having more fiscal space than the U.S. Uh, where does the role of market perception about sustainability of the fiscal, uh, you know, uh, for fiscal uh, uh, deficit or the, or the fiscal space? I think it's ve all very well to measure it in some ways, but somewhere or the other, we need to bring in uh, the market's own perception as to what they consider uh, to be more sustainable than the others. And if they would do that, uh, then I think you would find uh, that certain economies in Europe, although uh, in, the, in terms of, uh, you know, the reaction curves, et cetera, would, you know, would be more fiscal sustainable, they might not be uh, for a large, as a large economy like the U.S., uh, whose debt is more e easily acceptable uh, by the market. Uh, thank you. We are slightly over our time, but I think with this panel on these topics, we want to spend about 15 minutes uh, to have some discussion, have some questions. Uh, Stan Fisher had to go back to an official meeting, so I ask uh, Marco Beauty if he would uh, join us on the panel because some people may want to raise questions uh, on the remarks he made at the outset. Let me just start it if I might. Stan had to leave, but he raised two questions that I think are very central to this debate about exit strategies, policies going forward. First, he re referred to the part of the paper that talked about the sharp fluctuations in the exchange rate between dollar and euro. And he's quite right. Only four months ago, there were lots of anxieties in this country. The euro was getting undervalued. That was going to make the US problem harder. Today, it's the opposite. Um, is there a case for anything more than the joint abstinence that the paper proposes. Uh, should there be any more concerted coordination or cooperation between the two key currencies, the euro <laughs> and the dollar, to try to minimize instability in the system, minimize instability in the uh, economic uh, environment in the world, and to add to Stan's other point, to uh, maybe stop exacerbating 
the concerns in the rest of the world about competitive undervaluations, movements of currencies that would undermine other countries' uh, growth strategies. And then secondly, Stan raised the broader question, the anxiety, as he put it, across emerging markets. And I know from talking with him that his own Israel is in the midst of that as well. He's an intervener to a very big tune himself, doesn't like to do it, feels he has to do it because of what's happening in the rest of the world. That is a global problem. As he said quite explicitly, he made the distinction between countries who are overvalued and therefore resisting capital inflow, read Brazil, countries which are very undervalued and are aggressively trying to keep themselves there, read China. So what are the systemic implications? And as he said, nothing's been achieved in 60 years to deal with the surplus side of the adjustment problem. Should new steps be taken? And should the US and Europe lead in that direction? So let me ask first if any of the members of the panel would like to comment on that. Then we'll open it up for comments on that or broader questions. Nurio. Well, uh, I think the problem is we live in a world in which the U.S. needs a weaker dollar to grow its exports. The Eurozone, especially the periphery, is going to need a weaker euro to grow its exports. Japan needs a weaker yen to grow its exports. Uh, UK needs a weaker pound to grow its exports. Uh, even the Swiss are intervening to prevent the franc from appreciating. And since China doesn't want to let its own exchange rate appreciate, as Stan pointed out, everybody else in emerging markets from Latin America to Asia is intervening like crazy to prevent their currency from appreciating because they don't want to lose market shares relative to China. But you cannot be a world in which all currency weaken relative to each other, right? So, you know, the FX market for the last few months has been a contest, uh, a beauty contest, but no, not with the prettiest, but the least ugly, right? You know, until May, June, uh, the dollar was less ugly and the euro looked like very ugly because of the risk of a collapse of the eurozone, the faults, you name it. Then they patched up things in eurozone, Q2 numbers were better, and in the summer the US numbers were worse, and then the dollar became less ugly. And that's what's happening. And agreeing or not currency intervention, in my view, is meaningless because, as I pointed out, monetary policy is a form of intervention. If the ECB is on hold and talking about exit, and US and UK and BOJ are going to do more QE, and the US is going to do massive more QE, then the ECB will have to decide either they accept that and they let the euro go to 150, 160, and have another double dip, or they'll be forced to intervene. And my answer is they're going to intervene, and they're going to intervene aggressively, and everybody's going to do the same, and everybody's going to have to follow US monetary policy, whether you like it or not. And there's all the side effects for then how EM deal with this inflow of capital, and it's not an easy answer. Capital controls, more intervention, letting your currency appreciate, credit controls, other types of controls is going to be a royal mess. John? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, focus on the, this uh, QE debate and the implication. I, I think the discussion we, we're having is really about what, what is really QE and uh, the different uh, approaches to it. If you take the view that it's uh, monetary policy by, by other means, uh, and uh, this doesn't imply uh, any uh, you know, monetization leading to, to, to inflation, provided you have at the same time uh, a fiscal framework for the medium term. And uh, I think that the line we're taking in the, in the paper, and I take from, from Lorenzo that he's saying, uh, you know, provided this condition is in place, uh, we are wrong to consider that there is something in the mandate of the ECB or in the setup and the relationship between the ECB <coughs> and government that would prevent it to uh, contemplate such an approach if uh, it, we are in a condition where it would uh, be deemed uh, appropriate. Um, so, but, but without the, the, the fiscal framework in the medium term, that's a different story because then uh, it uh, obviously leads to the expectation that, in, in fact, the name of the game is just to inflate away. Uh, and I think that very much the core of the, of, of the, of the issue we are discussing between uh, the U.S. and Europe, and in, in a way this is a response, Fred, to the, your first question, you know, do we not need to, to go beyond? I think uh, the, the difficulty or the inability to commit fiscally in this country is a big problem uh, for what we are discussing. Uh, uh, I know the institutional constraints, uh, but I think from, from our perspective, we cannot uh, but say that it is a major, a major issue. On your, on your second question, uh, the way I would put it is, 
uh, you know, the real exchange rate adjustment needs to take place not only vis-à-vis uh, -vis China, but vis-à-vis -vis the block of uh, emerging countries that are having a very good crisis, uh, as Marco would, would have said. Uh, essentially, uh, no, no permanent effect, certainly, on their, on their potential output and a very significant rebound, no fiscal adjustment down the road. Uh, the numbers put forward by the IMF are extremely impressive. 7% of point of GDP fiscal adjustment in the years to come in the advanced countries, basically zero in the emerging countries. This has implications for, for real exchange rates. And, and, and the question is, you know, where is, who is holding the key to this adjustment? And then we're back, uh, we're, we're back to China. But I, we, we shouldn't look at it from a, from a relatively narrow perspective. We should look at the issue from a, this broader perspective of the relative exchange rate uh, adjustment. Rajiv. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, in, in India's case, between April and now, the rupee is appreciated about 8 9%. We are going to run a current account deficit about 3.5%, which is more than what we uh, plan to do, uh, we, we had planned to do. Uh, and that our uh, net exports still contribute negative 8% to our growth, GDP growth. And I'm pointing all of this out because uh, I think there can be a, a such a possibility that, uh, led by the IMF's mutual assessment process, if it is country specific, that there could be developed a set of norms uh, for uh, you know uh, preventing market intervention, the horror of which you know you just talked about. I think that that is possible. That could be done, and I think that should be attempted. But at the moment, uh, nobody seems to be having the political will uh, to talk to talk talk at that you know to, to go in that direction. I think that's, that's the road to take. It, it can be done. Uh, I, but I'm not so certain that there will be these massive interventions, because I think countries would, uh, economies in Europe and US, uh, you know, would, I think, uh, see that that is really a road to common ruination for all. Uh, as Stan said, uh, a lot of this has been triggered by China, which, of course, has been intervening massively, a billion dollars a day for five years, keep its currency severely depressed. And Stan flagged that for 60 years, the system has not had an effective response to that kind of problem. Uh, I put in your folders today an op-ed I had in the Financial Times on Monday that did propose an approach to it, uh, which would be what I call countervailing currency intervention. If the Chinese are going to buy a billion dollars a day, the U.S. should sell a billion dollars a day to counter that. I'm pretty sure that would deter the whole process. If you put something like that in place, under authorization by the IMF to pursue systemic goals, <coughs> multilaterally agreed, then I think you'd have, for the first time, an effective mechanism to counter. If the Europeans get into the business more, the euro becomes more and more a key currency, they, of course, would want to do that as well if their currency was being artificially inflated by the actions of other countries. Under the IMF rules, countries are obligated to consult with other countries in whose currencies they intervene, but they don't do it. They've never done it, and that's one more shortcoming in the system. This is just one idea to maybe try to fill that gap. It goes beyond the, so the scope of today's discussion, uh, but I tried to throw that out to see if we could begin thinking about filling the systemic void which now, as Stan put it, as Nurio has just uh, luridly expanded on it, um, could in fact uh, be a very big source of global economic and financial trouble. Okay, we've got five more minutes. Questions, observations, the floor. Uh, see if I, yes. Hi, uh, Liz Chong from Emerging Markets. I just wanted to ask the members of the panel, um, the debate uh, surrounding capital controls as such uh, in the market that there seems to be acceptance that it is going to, they are going to come. What um, measures would you suggest governments can consider in terms of introducing capital controls? Lorenzo? No, not on that one. No, not on that one. No, Joe? Rajiv? Capital controls, um, something that uh, been seriously considered. It was also done, uh, I, uh, it was also considered in the early 90s, actually. And then we sort of brought up all the Tobin, literature on Tobin tax, et cetera, and so on. And what, uh, is, uh, at least, I think, for the emerging economies, which don't have very deep uh, you know, capital markets, deep financial markets, uh, this does cause a lot of uh, you know, uh, uncertainty and, 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 and appreciation, et cetera, and, and the damage. And it is, it is very much on the cards, I think. It's very much on the cards, uh, and, 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 and authorities are looking at it. Uh, and will, uh, th the other way, of course, is the sterilization process, you know, which is what uh, India had adopted in the last two years. Um, but uh, not yet, but I don't think it can be ruled out. OK. Uh, Joe? 
Please identify and then far away. <laughs> sure. Joe Gagnon, Peterson Institute. Uh, I have a question about monetary exit strategies we talked about. I agree with uh, what Lorenzo said about um, back in 2003, 2004, probably the Fed was too easy for too long and, and that was a mistake. But another lesson is that if you aren't easy enough to get the economy back on track, you actually delay exit quite a bit. Uh, a year ago, we were all talking about monetary exit. Um, and in fact, I was saying that we need actually more monetary ease. I think it's clear now that if the Fed and the ECB had done that and taken my advice, we would be talking about exit now, but we're not. And in fact, the ECB is not talking about exit and the Fed is actually talking about further ease. Uh, so I guess the question I have for the Europeans is, in the US, the reason we're doing this seems to me is that uh, core inflation is heading down and it's down to one and, and threatening to go lower and the Fed uh, doesn't want that. Uh, in, the EC, in the Euro area, as I calculated, if you exclude value added tax, uh, which I think you must, uh, otherwise you have uh, monetary policy uh, reinforcing fiscal policy in a bad way. Uh, the core inflation rate in the euro area is a half of 1% in the past 12 months. Uh, that's way below target. Now, I understand that in the past, the core inflation rate hasn't been a good predictor of future inflation. You care about headline inflation. Core inflation sometimes went up to headline in the past. But that seems to have changed lately. In particular, in 2008, the ECB responded to headline inflation. It turned out headline inflation didn't stay high. It, it dropped down below core. Uh, I think in the future that that may be likely. Is this an issue that people at the ECB are, in Europe are worried about, that maybe deflation is heading your way? Uh. You asked many questions. Um, as far as I saw from the charts, by the way, the U.S. is recovering, is recovering stronger than the, than, than the euro area. The point is that uh, jobs are not coming back. So maybe in this country people think that monetary policy is very useful to, to increase jobs um, in a way that, um, that is not clear to me uh, how this can happen. Um, so to push even further quickly monetary policy back, back on track. Um, by the way, on VAT, it depends. depends if VAT, if you have a once-for-all increase, but if you have every year an increase uh, and you don't take into account, as we have had in the euro area, by the way, uh, uh, systematically during the last decade, uh, uh, part of inflation increase was due to indirect uh, taxes. And then if you monetize this, this is a, monetiz is, is a monetization of fiscal policy, so you, you cannot really take it away. Uh, third observation is true that core inflation is, is low. I think uh, core inflation is core inflation. Our objective is headline inflation, so for us it's more important to forecast well uh, headline inflation. And headline inflation, as we are forecasting it, is between one and a half and a bit higher uh, going forward. Of course, we look at many indicators, so we consider that current rates are appropriate. I don't want to be boring and repeat things that have been said. So um, I think when we talk about exit strategies, most people are talking about instruments, the way in which monetary policy is implemented. And we have exited the, some of the instruments that we have applied, uh, the 12 months um, fixed rate full allotments, the six months, and the markets uh, are adjusting quite well to that. By the way, the exit strategy is, uh, is endogenous in the euro area because it depends on the demand of liquidity by the banks. So if the banks need less liquidity, um, well, they apply for less uh, and then this is, automatic, uh, is an automatic uh, exit. Now some people may believe that you may force the liquidity on the banks by, by doing many things, but it's not obvious to me that this is working because then the banks bring the back the liquidity to the central bank. So, uh, and it's not obvious to me that uh, this uh, kind of uh, forcing the banks to uh, get more liquidity by purchasing everything is bringing <coughs> about results in terms of uh, lowering long-term interest rates, as I sh have shown uh, myself. And I think if you want to have low interest rate, it's better to anchor inflation. By the way, I think if you, to, tomorrow you said in Europe, uh, let's aim at 4%. Okay. I mean, I don't think, or whatever, uh, I don't I don't think people would be happy, but automatically interest rate would go up. So I don't think that we would gain a lot, except for, for losing credibility 
in, uh, in, um, in our monetary policy. So I think the exit in the end depends on underlying conditions. If the economy improves, to some extent endogenously, the markets uh, will ask for less, and this is what we are observing. And we don't believe in a theory that you, you have to force market, uh, market participants to hold much more liquidity. And the graphs I showed show that this liquidity is not necessarily flowing to the system. Okay, Marco, and then Joan, and we'll wind up this panel. No, just as a compliment, uh, um, tackling a bit indirectly uh, the set of questions. I mean, uh, a very <coughs> important divide uh, uh, across the Atlantic is on the interpretation of the crisis. Um, I mean, basically, um, in this country here, we tend to see the drop in output, the increase in output gap, the, as essentially a cyclical phenomenon. And uh, the, um, the response uh, is of uh, the classic Keynesian uh, type, you know, pushing it to the, uh, to the limit. In Europe, uh, we tend to see the crisis having, for the advanced economies, not only for Europe, but for the rest uh, of the advanced economies also, having a lasting you know, legacy and, uh, and leaving permanent scars, uh, which uh, would only be mended uh, uh, through policies which, is n which are not of the short-term macroeconomic uh, uh, nature. Uh, not only at least of that, but mainly of the structural nature. So we see the divide, and I think it seems to me in line with the whole uh, strand of uh, uh, literature between the advanced economies and the emerging economies. Advanced economies, emerging economies have had two different crises. I mean, the typical <laughs> banking and financial crisis affected uh, the advanced economies, and the research shows that to recover through, uh, from this crisis takes time because of the deleveraging and all the, all the uh, rest of things that we saw. So it is, uh, I think it is normal that we see the exit from the crisis uh, with a gradual subdued recovery in the, in, in the US and, and, and in Europe. Emerging economies uh, didn't have a this type of crisis. I mean, basically their financial system, because of uh, it was underdeveloped, uh, under public uh, ownership, because of very strict uh, regulatory um, um, framework, uh, basically suffered from a more a deep, a more classic type of crisis, which led to a V-shape uh, uh, recovery. So I think this is an element that I think is uh, important also in assessing the degree of uh, and the type of responses. And uh, the, uh, I mean, if you take this different interpretation together with the fact that this country here can afford, and uh, here I'm, I say something a bit provocative, uh, uh, this can afford unemployment less than we can afford in Europe because of the social security systems and because of the welfare mechanisms that we have, which are much more generous in Europe compared to this uh, country, then this leads to a, uh, uh, a strong accent on the macro uh, response and not enough on the structural response. John? Two points. First, I fully agree with, with Marco, but to push it a little bit further, uh, what you're saying is that essentially someone is, is wrong either the US or uh, um, the policy community or the open policy community is wrong. That's not the reality that differs so much, that's uh, the, the, the way to look <coughs> at the reality. Uh, we can discount some differences in the way uh, markets work, but, but then there would still be this element. So what if the, the US uh, is wrong? Is that basically uh, you know, it's going to be frustrated by, by uh, curing a structural problem by Keynesian means? Uh, and that means uh, that means uh, no. they we're back to the 70s, right, basically this kind of, 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 of situation. What if we in, in Europe are, are wrong? That means we're going to, to do to do the opposite, and we're going uh, you know, to not not to solve our pollution <coughs> problems by focusing and on the structural dimension and by believing that it is structural. So I think that's uh, I very much agree with that, and but that that's a, a, a strong point that we will learn who was wrong and who will, who is right. On uh, Rajiv's point, I wanted to react on your uh, suggestion of a higher uh, inflation target and also link that to the granularity debate. Uh, I think you're uh, underestimating the fact that there's a lot of adjustment, of, in fact, going on within the euro area, uh, that a number of countries have to regain uh, competitiveness to de depreciate in real terms, that this process is likely to be asymmetric, 
uh, with respect to countries in a much uh, better situation, say Germany. And that this probably implies a continued pressure uh, uh, on, uh, on the aggregate uh, inflation rate. <coughs> and so I would see the risk of undershooting the, uh, infl the, the target of the ECB. So I wouldn't wish uh, the ECB to increase its target. I just would wish the ECB to be on target. And I think that's going to be a challenge. 